Welcome back to The Black Track, where I do commentary and review on movies with an all-black cast, or at least a black lead. The black film renaissance of the early 90s was without a doubt one of the best eras for black movies, if not the best. Though if you wanted to look at it with a more critical eye, one could say that the movies very rarely deviated from one particular theme, that being hood and gang culture movies. It was just what was hot at the time, and pretty much every black movie had to have some element of it. Even so-called love films like Poetic Justice and comedies like Friday had a backdrop of gangs and violence. In steps the movie Love Jones, directed by Theodore Witcher, which believe it or not, to this day, is his one and only film. Witcher was able to market the movie to a New Line Cinema executive as a romance movie that shows a different side of black life, a more intellectual side. No gangs, no murder, no drugs, just black people living and enjoying life. The executive was so ready to make something different than the norm that she immediately greenlit it and got to work finding a cast. Love Jones stars Lorenz Tate and Nia Long as Darius Lovehall and Nina Mosley, two people at a crossroads in their romantic life who have a chance meeting and start to fall for each other. It's crazy to think that Theodore Witcher actually didn't want Tate for the role at first because he believed that Tate, as a person, was closer to O-Dog, the character that he played in Men to Society in real life. That's how you know you're a damn good actor when people start disliking you in real life for one role that you did years ago. Nia Long did it fare much better because the first choice for Nina was Jada Pankett. Even before all that stuff that she's been up to recently, I really don't think she would have been a good choice for this role, but we'll never know. They're backed up by Isaiah Washington, Lisa Nicole Carson, and Bill Bellamy for light comic relief. Love Jones had a bit of an uphill battle, being literally the only black romantic film in a sea of a bunch of hood films. But did it overcome trends to become a great movie that stands on its own? Let's black track and find out. The movie opens with black and white video clips showing a celebration of blackness in the inner city Chicago area. It's actually a photo shoot. It's being done by Nina because she's a photographer in this movie. But you don't know that right now, so it seems like it doesn't make sense. These early shots do a very good job of setting the tone of the film, as you'll see. I do like this subtle form of character building though, showing the type of things that Nina has an eye for when she shoots. Speaking of the soundtrack, honestly, the whole damn thing is fire. And it was so good that it prompted the studio to re-release the movie in theaters for five months because people wanted to see the movie associated with the soundtrack. Soundtracks don't get much better than that. Director Theodore Witcher said that after Dion Ferris did the song Hopeless for this movie, that her career took a bit of a downturn because it was so different than what her fans were used to. What was this new sound that turned her fans off, you say? Well, it would eventually be known as Neo Soul. That's right. The Love Jones soundtrack was an early precursor to the Neo Soul music movement that would eventually take over the late 90s and early 2000s. Anyway, back to the actual movie. Damn! God bless cold Chicago weather. Lord have mercy. Nina is in the process of moving out of her boyfriend's house because that jam fool decided that he didn't want her anymore. Boy, if I only knew how timely that would be right now. I like how Theodore Witcher played with colors in this film, making it match the tone of what the characters were feeling. That's why the color is muted to an almost blue tone right now, because her sad. Her best friend Josie is played by Lisa Nicole Carson, who was in Devil in a Blue Dress right before this, but was mostly known for her role in Jason's lyric. Originally, Lauren Hill of the Fuji's fame was supposed to play Josie and came very close to getting the role, but her touring schedule prevented her from doing that, so she just sent over a song for the soundtrack instead. So next time you watch this, imagine an alternate universe where Jada Pinkett and Lauren Hill are in these scenes instead. Weird, I know. Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, Love Jones has a spoken word theme. The entire movie pretty much centers around the theme of poetry. I didn't really dig it when I was younger because I've just never really been that much into spoken word or poetry. But as I got older, I realized that it gives the movie kind of a Shakespearean romantic play feel like one of those Greek epic poems we used to read about in school. That coupled with the jazz and blues score makes the movie come across like a black film noir, which is something that I only recently noticed. Unfortunately, the delivery of said poetry by Mr. Darius Lovehall here is a little on the pretentious side. The spoken word is actually my least favorite parts of the movie. Really, all the banter between Darius and his friends Savon, Hollywood, Eddie, and Sheila is all kinds of pretentious, 
and even though most people who like this movie look back fondly on their friendly conversations, I thought a lot of the dialogue was a little cringe, and the topics are just weird. <laughs> like poetry is the possibility of language. Please <laughs> oh. give me a break. I will give the actors credit though, they deliver it in a way that makes it sound conversational, like it really isn't a script. Like they just sat down like real friends and started talking. Hell, maybe that was the problem. After a breakup, Nina just needed a fun night out on the town, and her and Josie end up at the same club as Darius and his friends. I applaud her for making the first move, because you rarely see that in movies or real life. Scratch that, you never see that in movies or real life. Hey Darius, a fine woman just basically laid the vagina right on your lap. What you gonna do with it? <laughs> Fumble the bag, of course. Or did he fumble the vag? Either way, he has to think on his feet if he wants to do a recovery, so he quickly assembles a smooth poem dedicated to Nina when he gets on the stage. Apparently, this is his job, but that can't be true, because for that to be true, this man would basically have to be unemployed. Anyway, all of that mishandling of the vagina had him with a one-track mind, and the poem was all about getting in her legs. But as Nina says in her review of it, there's nothing wrong with sex, there's just other topics. Like what? <laughs> but you probably wouldn't know anything about that. If him spilling the glass was a fumble, then this misguided poem might as well be a sack because Darius' balls are going nowhere. Ooh, a record store. I haven't seen one of those in ages. I can't wait to tell my kids that once upon a time, I had to actually buy music out of a store. The horror. Nina and Darius just so happened to share the same interest in music. What are the odds? It's really just another excuse for the movie to be just a little more pretentious. I've never heard this particular. Shh. It's kind of sad. Melancholy maybe, but uh, not sad. There's a difference, I think. Negro, please, who wrote this? This chance meeting is starting to look a little like fate. That is until Darius decides that he doesn't want to leave anything to fate and gets Nina's address off her check so he can follow her home. It's been a long time since I've seen this movie, so I can't say for sure whether I believe this was romantic or not back in the day, but I can say for certain that black women damn sure didn't. You see, New Line Cinema tested this film regularly with black women since they figured they would be the target audience. And let's just say that they had strong opinions about quite a few things in this film, this so-called stalking scene included. So you can't even blame this one on modern sensitivities. It was considered weird even in 1995. Conversely, director Theodore Witcher hated the test audiences. And to this day, he staunchly defends a lot of aspects of this movie. This scene included, and you can tell that he's pissy mad about how some of this stuff was received. Like Erica Badu once said, dude is sensitive about his shit. Wow, Nina sure has a nice place, lots of space. The movie kind of flies by this little detail, but it's actually not her place. She's house sitting, which makes me wonder, is Nina actually homeless? Cause how do you get this place lined up so quickly after a breakup, unless them seeds been planted? We never even find out whose place this is. Pretty sneaky. In the end, Nina does find Darius' actions kinda charming, so take that test audiences. They even go on a modest little date of hanging with friends and dancing. I personally would have led with the dancing, but that's just me. I'm not the one on a date with Nia Long though, so let me shut all the way the hell up. If Darius isn't anything else, he's persistent and pretty damn bold. He's trying to get that fuzzy temptress on day one, and like, you've already been stalking, so as soon as you try to play your cards a little safer and take your time, Hey, like I said, let me shut all the way the hell up. That thing must have been thinking too, because it's got this Negro up cooking and everything. Just look at that smile. He's ready to propose. The feeling is mutual too, because when Nina explains what happened to her homegirl, she breaks it down like it was a transcendent experience. It was like his dick just talked to me. I just want to know how they got this shot in this actual car with no cameras in the shot. Amazing. Usually, the actors aren't in a real car, but there's traffic and everything. I love this kind of stuff. 
Nina ain't waste no time getting to Darius' place. She's homeless, remember? So she has to mark her territory somewhere. She's introduced to Darius' penchant for old, antique everything. It's actually a running theme in the movie how he's into retro stuff. His motorcycle is old school, his decorations are old school, even his camera is old. He even has old vinyl records from his days as a DJ. Yeah, but what do you do now? Because I refuse to believe that you're a professional poet. There's even pictures of old girlfriends in his house. Everything is old. Yeah, you better get to work replacing that picture with new ones. I mean, it's not like Darius is the only one with more skeletons in the closet than Jeffrey Dahmer. Nina clearly jumped the gun on the breakup because her so-called ex came back like nothing happened and it's Raheem. He's from New York and everything. Of course, his real name is Khalil Kane, and in this movie, his name is Marvin. But that name sucks for him, so it's going to be Raheem for this video. Anyway, he wants Nina to come to New York and live with him, just like that. He didn't even try to romance her. He ain't even spring for a plane ticket. He's putting her on a train. But you know what? It worked. Thanks to bad advice from her homegirl Josie, of course. You see, by her logic, if she tells Darius that she's going to New York and he flips, then she got him and he's the one. If he acts like he doesn't care, then he's not the one because he doesn't care if she leaves or not. There's so much wrong with that scenario that I don't even know where to begin. But that's what this movie is all about. Two people winning stupid prizes by playing stupid games. I like how this scene is shot though. Darius is shot in a cool, blue, low saturation tone because he's supposed to be cold to the situation. Whereas Nina is shot in a more vibrant, warm tone because she's supposed to be the more positive one, I guess? Not really. Anyway, she greatly underestimates the pride of a man because Darius tells her to go ahead and get the hell out of his trap then. Of course, he's just as much full of it as she is, but he has to put on a brave face for his boy. Make no mistake about it though, him sad. However, if she thought she was the only one with something to fall back on, then she don't know my boy Darius too well. Meanwhile, in New York, Raheem only wants one thing, and it's not what you think it is. Hey. Hey. Where are my toasted oats? Oh, I finished the box this morning. Oh, you couldn't eat the damn Captain Crunch, could you? Oh, please. All we have, Marvin, is all of these years. And it's just not enough. Anymore. Oh. I'm going out for some motherfucking toasted oats. Damn, an argument over breakfast was enough to send Nina packing back to Chicago? Nah, it was more than that but I like to believe it was over something so petty. Whatever Raheem ended up eating, it totally gave him the itis because he not only slept through Nina packing and leaving, but she also managed to slide an engagement ring on his finger. Damn, how'd she do that? She's stealthy as hell. I guess you gotta be to be a photographer. Further adding to her stealthy nature, Nina snuck back in town unbeknownst to Darius and somehow expected to find him crying in the middle of the street like a bum still missing her. Man, fix your face. What did you think would happen? You tried playing games and Darius hit you with that Uno reverse card. Oh, but Nina isn't going down that easy and she has a hell of a draw four ready to drop on Darius. And she's changing the color to green for envy. When Hollywood comes to the studio after hearing Nina came back to town, he successfully gets her to agree to a date with him. And by all appearances, it seems like they had a good time. I actually like the fact that Hollywood doesn't take himself too seriously. So what kind of underwear do you have on? I don't wear drawers. You don't have any on right now. No, I just let it hang. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's the least pretentious person in this movie. Now hear me out, fellas. I know you watched this movie a bunch of times and thought to yourself that what Hollywood did was a massive man law violation. But to be real with you, I don't actually think it is. You see, in my eyes, Darius never actually announced Nina as his girl. Yeah, one could speculate, but Article 12, Section 38 of the man laws clearly states that one must announce to the squad that a new woman is your official girl or you forfeit all cuffing rights and she becomes fair game. Add to that fact that when she left town, Darius acted like he didn't even care. Well, you may disagree, but I have to say that Hollywood was well within his rights to try his try. However, he is definitely in violation when he decides he wants to try to brag about it by bringing Nina to a party attended by not only all of his friends, but also Darius. Now that was a bitch move and if you want to get on him about anything, this is it. Especially when he refuses to take her home. Are you going to take me home or not? Hell no. <sighs> he drives a hearse though, Nina. I think that was for the best. 
Of course, all of this is just an excuse to get our favorite couple back together. Yeah, they give each other a few angry words, but by the end of it all, they're back dancing it up with some Chicago steppers. I think it's great how the crew went out of their way to insert so much Chicago culture into the movie. These are legit steppers and musicians who were active in the area at the time, and it just helps make the movie feel more authentic. Same thing with these exterior shots. This is one of the most iconic shots of the movie in front of this fountain here, but of course the director hated it. Theodore Witcher said, with all the fog, it ruined the shot, and the studio refused to let him shoot it another day, so he just had to get it over with. But everybody who's seen the film ended up loving it, which goes to show that sometimes a director can get in his own way on his path to greatness. Me personally, I also love it. I think it just adds more to that film noir feel that the movie already has. It's at this point that I think Love Jones loses a little focus, or more accurately, it loses the plot. I think I just wanted more when it comes to Darius and Nina's conflict, other than him still being stuck on his ex. That woman doesn't have a single line in this film, and she feels more like a glorified extra than something the plot should revolve around. Plus it just feels too easy. I mean, things looked like they were going great. And you know the best way to show how great things were going in a short period of time? That's right, you guessed it. Musical montage, but with jazz. I mean, look at this. Frolicking in the fields, hanging out with friends, developing what are probably nude photos of themselves. Life is good. Nina even took up smoking to show how all in she is. Surely they could have found a better way to ruin this than, oh, he's still stuck on his ex. I mean, give us some more clues or something. What's so special about his ex? Is she rich? Does she cook a mean hot dog? Is she a throat goat? You can't show us all of that and then expect us to believe that Darius is going to throw this all away for this mystery woman with no character development. They pull that old boomerang gag where you think she's asleep, but oh no, my brother. If you didn't know, every black woman in 90s movies was a light sleeper. This leads to a massive argument that results in Darius putting her the fuck out. And he's so cold with it, too. I guess that's everything. Shut my door all the way when you leave. That was sassy as hell. There's a lot of time lapse in this movie, and what seems like it's only a few days ago, it's actually a few weeks or even months ago. After putting Nina out, Darius receives an anonymous tip call that Nina is boarding a train very soon to leave for good, and if he has even a tiny bit of feelings left for her, then he should go catch that train. It's not actually an anonymous call though, it's actually her friend Josie, and I'm glad to see that she isn't the stereotypical bitter friend who doesn't want to see Nina happy. On top of that, I'm also happy that Love Jones bucks the romantic movie trend of the guy running the girl down at a plane or train station and catching her at the last minute so he can profess his love to her and win her heart in front of an audience of strangers. Because Darius straight up misses her and is forced to walk away with the poop face for being so stubborn. And I like that, because not everything has to have a happy ending. And if Theodore Witcher had his way, the movie would have ended right here, and I wouldn't have even been mad. But of course, the studio and the test audiences can't take it when something doesn't have a basic ass resolution that you could see coming a mile away, or one that challenges you. So we get a bit of a coda at the end, not unlike the Tactone ending at the end of Boomerang that was also added last minute unnecessarily. You can tell that it was an afterthought because we get yet another time lapse, this time a whole year, and Nina comes back in town briefly hoping that Darius would be at the club they first met at because she wanted to recite a poem for him. I mean, why wouldn't he be? He is a professional poet after all. She gets through it despite holding back tears and fearing that all hope is lost, she heads for a taxi before Darius notices her and gets to say all the things that he wanted to say that day at the train station. I personally think the ending is pretty iconic as far as black romance movies go and it's one of the rare instances where the test audiences made things better. If you had to guess, what is the one thing that you think black women had a problem with in this scene? I shouldn't even have to tell you because there's a reason this scene takes place under a bridge. The test women said that there's absolutely no way that a black woman would allow her hair to get rained on, no matter how in love she was. So this scene was reshot under this little overpass to make it more believable. And of course, Theodore Witcher, say it with me now, absolutely hated it. Have I mentioned yet how much director Theodore Witcher hates test audiences, especially ones filled with black women. No, because I'm starting to see why this is his one and only movie. Let's get to the grade.
Love Jones is a bit of an underrated movie despite being a cult classic and beloved by a ton of black people, especially black women. I don't really know what happened when it was released that made it underperform at the box office, making only 12 million on a 7 million budget. Could it be that it came around at the tail end of the early 90s gang film boom and people just wanted more of that? Or is it because it was one of the first of its kind black romance movies and therefore had to crawl before movies like Love and Basketball walked? Maybe it was just good old fashioned bad marketing. Whatever the reason, people missed out on a pretty decent movie with great cinematography and even better music. The set pieces and costume design really are the stars of this movie and everything about the city feels alive and really jumps out of the screen. It's one of those movies that makes you go, damn, I wouldn't have mine living there. Like I said earlier, it has a style that's just unique among black films and it's more film noir than anything else. It's kind of crazy how I never picked up on that before now. I don't think any other black film noir movies have ever been made, making Love Jones the only black movie with this mixture of jazz, soul, and story. Since this movie did a lot to popularize neo-soul music, I guess you can kind of call it a neo-noir. Its only shortcomings to me are the pretentious characters with their silly and unrealistic banter and the story being afraid to take risks. Despite that though, I think Lorenz Tate and Nia Long make for a believable on-screen couple, and I could completely believe it if they were a real couple off-screen. Love Jones is the type of movie you put on in the background and just subconsciously absorb the music and the culture of it all. It's kinda groundbreaking in a way since it's literally never been done again, which I guess is appropriate for a guy who never did anything else in Hollywood. My grade for Love Jones is B-. The fact that it contains zero stereotypes it's enough for me to highly recommend it to anybody. And that's it for another episode of The Black Track. Let me know what you thought about the movie Love Jones in the comments below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe and tell your friends about my channel. And until next time, I'll holla at you.